Hi, my name is LaQuincy Reed, and I'm with Romy Owens. She was a former uh, space artist here at the Skirvin, and also an artist that does fiber, do installations, and all kinds of stuff. So go ahead and give you an introduction about yourself. Great. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Romy. I was the first artist in residence here. I love that you called it the space resident, like, that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is, it's the space residency. Um, and I do work primarily with fiber in installation and big projects, big ideas. Yep, all over Oklahoma. Okay. Yep. So you were the very first uh, artist in residence here at the Skirvin. Yes. What was that like? Did you know what to expect? Had you done an artist nope. residency, residency before? Or? Yes, I had done residencies before. Um, this being the first for the Skirvin, for the Paseo, and for me in Oklahoma City, it was uh, a lot of learning on the job for all of us. Uh, it was a challenging year, but a really rewarding year. Okay, so you said it was challenging and you were learning. So what were some of the challenges and what were some of the things that you learned? Um, I learned a lot of patience, yeah. which is good always. Anytime you're public facing, like just learning how to ex explain your art or explain what you're doing or why you're here that, you know, those are valuable tools in my, in my toolkit now. Um, and you know, it was new for the Skirvin. So the Skirvin employees, uh, on, in a lot of ways I had to train them mm -hmm. as we were going. Uh, there was a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. just challenges. Yeah. Yeah. It's without just... being super specific about what they were, it was yeah. a challenging year Yeah. for sure. Okay. So, you mentioned, you know, engaging the public, talking to people, kind of mm -hmm. being on display mm -hmm. and everything like that. How did you approach uh, people wanting to come and see your work? Because normally what happens with me is I see them over there at the door over there and they just kind of look at me and then I look back and then they look at me some more and I look at them yeah. and then I'll either tell them to come on in and they dart, oh, I didn't know I could come in. I'm like, yeah, you can come in. or they scurry away because they just had like, you know, 30 seconds to kind of right. stop. So how do you, how did you engage them? How did you handle that? That, it was really interesting because this is very much a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. Like you are very public and on display with the street and with uh, this traffic mm -hmm. and with the traffic at the other um, side. And a lot of people who, yeah. who this is the engagement they want to have, which, yeah. yeah but. Um, when people would come in, you know, you just talk to them and they'd be like, why, what, why, how, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and you answer the questions. But um, one of the cool things for me with what I was doing in my residency is I had a photo booth set up so people could come in and I would take photographs of them mm -hmm. um, and then share them online. And that engagement, even in the most simplest of ways, marking moments or anything, was a nice thing for me to be able to latch onto and say, mm -hmm. no, come in sit down, I'll take your photograph for free. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to give me anything. I'm doing this for fun so we can kind of document who the patrons are of the Skirvin. And I don't know, it was, it was cool in that regard. But yeah, a lot of people just wanting to look and not engage. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's really an important part of what this residency can do is open up that sphere of audience artist engagement um, in an atypical way like you don't really expect going to a hotel that there's going to be an artist who's working in such a very mm -hmm. visible place so I think that it's kind of on par with a festival in that people get to engage with artists outside of the gallery and I yeah. think that that's really positive okay so you've done installations correct and mm -hmm. how do you how do you compare uh, doing an installation with being uh, kind of, in, in, in a certain sense, you are the installation mm -hmm. here. How do, how do those two things kind of compare in your mind, or do they even compare at all? They totally compare, and it's interesting to even try and make that connection. Um, to me, the commonality between them is just vulnerability. Anytime mm -hmm. we're putting our art out there, putting ourselves out there, there's a vulnerability of like, how are people going to respond? Are they going to like what we do? Are they going to like us? Are mm -hmm. they going to like, what is it? How, how will people connect with us as people or with the art that we make? Um, and so I think vulnerability is that common tie between the two. 
period. Like, I can't even think of, I, I'm sure there are others, and there are people who are probably watching this that are like, what about this? What about this? Yeah, yeah those things too. I don't know what they are. For me, vulnerability is, yeah. is at the heart of all of it. Okay. Yeah. So let's backtrack a little bit. We talked a lot about the Skirvin. So let's talk, if you don't mind, yeah. more about, you know, your personal journey as an mm-hmm. artist. How did you determine that, you know, you wanted to be an artist, and then additionally, how did you determine that you wanted to work with fiber and installations versus, you know, typically yeah. what everybody wants to do is paint or draw. Right. Painting and drawing definitely are at the heart of all art, aren't mm-hmm. they? I mean, most people understand it. It is what anybody, if you ever describe and say I'm an artist, the first question is what do you paint, what do you draw? Mm-hmm. Like that's the assumption is that's what the baseline is because the majority of artists do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I came to art very late in light life I wouldn't say that I was I and I still wouldn't say that I'm naturally skilled like some people have natural aptitude for drawing or painting or sculpting in the ways that you do or others um, I wouldn't say that I have those natural skills at all I think I'm a natural um, writer I think writing comes very easy it's what most of my background was in prior to becoming an artist but anyway that I, that's a whole long I need to be more succinct. Um, no, you're good. You talk as long as you need. Oh, I want to hear you. your story. Thank you. Um, I became an artist in my 30s mm-hmm. and I had not studied art in junior high or high school or college, really. I came to art late after 9-11. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's interesting to be able to talk about this in the context of what we're going through right now with post-COVID. Mm-hmm. So we see this great resignation, which is significant and profound and I think something similar happened after 9-11 where you see this really monumental shift in our culture that whether it impacted us directly or whether we're just witnesses to it really makes us take stock of our lives and and what we're doing and are we happy and how to live happy lives Mm -hmm. and so after 9-11 I kind of had one of those moments where I was just like this I'm not happy doing this this is not what I want to do and I went back to school kind of to figure out what I wanted to do, and I didn't know. Um, but through the course of the very first semester going back to school, I loved photography. Mm-hmm. I loved my photo class. I kind of had a little, like, come to Jesus talk with myself about, like, how how and what, and ended up getting a master's in photography. Mm-hmm. From that, and joining the art community in a broader sense, like that connection through grad school and meeting people that led to one thing that led to another and this person and then that person and people who are so generous with their mentorship or with their advice or with their really guidance is a good word for it, led me to becoming a full-time professional artist, starting with photography then adding thread, then removing the photography, and just working with thread or yarn or whatever it is. Uh, That's how I became fiber. Through exploration of the art, I think I'm lucky in that I came to it at the point in my life where I was able to start conceptualizing things quicker, whereas I think 18 and 19-year-olds who start to pursue an art career, maybe it takes a little longer for them to start developing developing conceptual basis to their work, um, I came at it as art is a tool for communication yeah. as opposed to art is a way to decorate our lives. So I started discussing ideas right away with my art and that that sets you on a path. I mean, I'm not a festival artist, I'm not a, I am a gallery artist, but like gallery shows are not my main forte. Um, I really like tackling ideas and tackling concepts and introducing something to the public conversation that hopefully pushes us as society. I mean, even in a little micro way, like I'm not trying to do it globally. I'm not even trying to do it nationally. I'm just trying to make an impact in the place where I live. Yeah. Well, you know what's really interesting about it is you said the difference between an 18, 19 year old is they're making art to kind of decorate their lives versus being older and you have that more introspective or retrospective of your life and with the world around you, you come across art as a way to kind of communicate and deal with ideas. And I really, I really resonate with that. I really relate to that because as an art teacher, I was a public school art teacher for nine years. 
and the kids would always, especially with Instagram being so big, they wanted to, or Pinterest, they wanted to do what they saw on Pinterest. They yes. wanted to see a picture, do a picture. Yeah. And even when I was a kid, I was wanting to draw comic book characters. I wanted to see a picture, do a picture. Yeah. And I would say that's, I mean that's that's fine. But when we're what we want to, I wanted them to do is I wanted them to at the very least reference three different things and try and combine them so that yeah. they could find their own voice. And it was really it was really a struggle to try and get them to do it. It seemed like they just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Nope. But you know, I, I I was really trying to push them to try and think outside of seeing a picture, do a picture, mm-hmm. and trying to get them to do something that uh, was uniquely theirs. Yes. And I'm not sure if I got across to a lot of the kids. <laughs> that's that's what I was trying to do. Uh, a lot of them just kind of was like, Mr. Reed, you won't let me just see a picture. Like, yeah. So <laughs> it was just kind of what it was really tough because I do feel like when you get older, you do have you've got 30 years of life to look at. Mm-hmm. And as a kid, you got 19 years of life, and then for like half of it, maybe even more, you're just kind of goofing off and right. throwing things at the wall. Right. And, and so, uh, I, that that that's really, I really I really resonate with that. I really yeah I really relate with that very much. Um, so, I wanted to ask you about fiber, fiber specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, when I was going to college, I knew students that really gravitated toward that, and. I'm not really sure why. Oh yeah, it's 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 just one of those things. Like I I couldn't like I could understand painting, I could understand sculpture, I could understand drawing, I can like all these other things. Yeah. I I couldn't understand what would draw somebody outside of you know making something utilitarian. Yeah, right. Why why did you gravitate toward fiber? So I would I'll say that I started using fiber for its functionality. Mm -hmm. Like I was piecing photographs together and stitching them together Mm -hmm. and the functionality of making, because tape can fail. I mean, ultimately, I have yet to find a tape that over time eventually (laughs) won't fail. And so I was like, no, if I stitch this together, Mm -hmm. it's gonna hold. Like there's no way it's gonna come apart unless somebody takes a seam ripper and ripped out my seams, which, you know, I guess could happen. Anyway, um, but as I continued to work with the material and work with the process and fall in love with the process and start to think about all the hands that have done this and all the mending that happens and all the creation that happens and even when it's functional as fiber typically is, how you know it leans into women's work, it leans into comfort, it leans into nurturing, it leans into uh, maternal instinct and all of those things that go into creation um, and it just as my understanding of art grew my understanding of process and my understanding of materials grew and I and I love fiber art for that reason because it does conjure all those all the women's work and turns it into something non-functional but also unique and original like that's at the end of the day you know it's interesting you brought up the kids and how so much of that early stage of art is learning how to emulate what other people have done. And I certainly am no stranger to that. Like I can point to every single step I've done and say, here's the artist that I was really inspired by. And I tried to make my own spin on it. Um, in the beginning with the thread on the photos, it was Doug and Mike Starn. They're twins, they're, photo- they're photographers, they make beautiful photographs, and then they also use stitch work mm-hmm. in there. And it was just like, oh, well, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Let me figure out how to make that my own. And then taking it to thread installations, it's like Gabriel Daw, who's a Dallas-based artist, is just like making these completely rock star, amazing thread installations. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't want to do what he's doing, but wow, like, look at what he's doing. Yeah. How can I make that my own? And yeah. I think that fiber, because we're so used to it in this context yeah. of clothing or in bedding or in comfort and pillow forts and blanket forts and things like that, like taking it to a different place is really rewarding and satisfying. Mm-hmm. I love how satisfying it is. I love being able to work with fiber, make something that is not useful and uh, defies expectation. Okay. Well, that kind of leads us into talking about your piece that you donated to the Skirvin. Oh, yeah. So uh, you've been really gracious with your time. I don't want to hog too much of it, but uh, let's go ahead and 
take everything down over here and then head up and we'll go talk about your work up there. Does that sound great? That sounds great. All right. Okay. We're here on the second floor of the Skirvin mm -hmm. uh, with all the other past artists and residents and their artwork. And here we have Romy. So Romy, go ahead and talk about yours. So this is a mandala that I made um, a few years ago and I like I love how the colors spectrum out. Um, I'm a big fan of using color repetition in line, and so that's what we see here. Um, circles, completion, mm -hmm. you know, just everything inclusive, everything happy, everything whole. When I make anything circular, the song, uh, Make New Friends But Keep the Old, mm -hmm. goes through my head, you know, when I silver and what, and circles around, blah, blah, blah. That's how long I want to be your friend, like all of it. I love that. I just love circles. I love the completion of it, so. Okay. So, uh, what are the materials of this? Is it? Paper, oh, thread. Paper, thread? Paper, thread. No, no special kind of paper, just? It is special paper, for okay. sure. It's a very heavy weight paper. It's 300 pound paper, okay. and I double stack it. So, it's okay. 600 pounds of paper that I then poke a bunch of holes in. Mm -hmm. I create the pattern and poke all the holes, and then I start sewing. Okay. Yeah. So, is this all done? There, are you doing anything on the computer at all? Or are you yes. Doing, okay. The plotting of the points is done on the computer. Okay. So the paper, this 300 pound paper that I use is photo paper. Okay. And so I'm able to plot it all digitally in my computer and then run it through the printer and there are teeny tiny little holes that mm -hmm. guide me where everything gets placed because for a long time I did it manually like lines and yeah, the computer yeah. really simplified that. <laughs> so is it just regular thread as well? Mm -hmm. It's just a simple sewing thread, like literally the kind of sewing thread you would put on a sewing machine. Okay. Yeah. So one thing that I did notice about it is that uh, we do have a gradient and a transition, but you've also broken up that gradient mm -hmm. and that transition in that center circle there. Right. So, what led you to make that, that artistic choice? I like that it kind of mirrors how flowers work with a mm -hmm. petal and a central core that typically has something contrasting inside of it. It's typically a black seed or it's a, some kind of alternate color in, mm -hmm. in that ring, zinnias, it's yellow, like it's just different with every flower. But I like that idea that kind of conjuring that uh, floral motif of yeah. center core with petals that radiate out. So, uh, are circles uh, a very recurring theme in a lot of your they work? They have been lately, lately, for sure, yeah. I'm a big fan of the circle right now, and I think it's partly informed by recent experiences that mm -hmm. make me feel like everything is hard and angular, and I'm just like, no, can we make it soft and round? Like, mm -hmm. I just like that. I want to put that energy into the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us no, about the work? <laughs> but thank you. I mean, look at all this beautiful work. Yeah. It's really great to see all of it. It's great. Um, what are your What are your socials, and how can everybody reach you? Your website, uh, and all that stuff. Social RomeoOwens.com, okay. um, the RomeoOwens on Instagram, RomeoOwens on Facebook. That's about all my social. I just deleted my Twitter. Okay. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Good for you. I'm ready to delete all, all of it, but yeah. I'm going to keep on, keep it for a little longer. I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people need to delete a lot of social media, but right? it's good for it's good for reaching out to people. It so. is. It is. It's good to feel uh, your community even in a toxic mm -hmm. environment such yeah. as social media. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it was very nice visiting Thank with you. you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for doing this. Thank I think you. it's really awesome that you're doing this and that you're extending and connecting all of us as residents. I think it's really beautiful. Thank well, you. Thank you. And um, we'll try and get the rest of them. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if we can have, have get that happen soon. Right. So we'll see you. And uh, also, before we forget, uh, what do you have coming up uh, next? Mm, I just uh, am in the final two weeks of Sugar High. Sugar High is an immersive installation in Enid that I'm part of with 24 other artists, and it concludes May 8th. Okay. Um, and then I don't know what's next. Okay. I don't know. I'm excited to find out, though. All right. But yeah. you'll, you'll keep us updated on yeah. your social media and everything like of that. Course. Of All course. Of right. course. Yeah. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you.